Back on August 5th, 2020, we released an episode called Search for Shoes. That episode, we got to hear from a representative named Tracy from Samaritan's Feet. But it broke my heart to know that more than 1.5 billion people are affected by parasitic disease that are transferred by contaminated soil because they don't have proper footwear. That shoes, they can help prevent against diseases. They can help protect against diseases. They can even help our economic and educational opportunities because we have proper footwear. They can also help an individual pursue their dreams. So if you're one to know more about Samaritan's Feet, do so right now. Jump right over to SamaritansFeet.org. But let me give you some crazy numbers to think about. $50 provides a brand new pair of shoes and a message of hope to two children. $100 provides a message of hope and shoes for four children. This holiday season, as you consider how you spend your money and where you spend it, can I just ask you to consider giving a financial gift to Samaritan's Feet right now? Again, if you're interested in doing that, please visit Samaritan's Feet. Org. Thank you so much for listening and Merry Christmas. Hey, come take a walk with me. Not like you used to do. do something different. Put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction. Change your perspective. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining us today. Super excited that you've chosen to stop by today. I've always appreciate that. Right now, if you want to, jump right over to OPSpodcast.com. You can leave a review there on the show. You can even leave a voicemail there. It's pretty fun to do. You can even leave a message about what you like, what you hate, what you just are... I don't know what what you just want to say about the show. I'm always excited to get those feedback. So please be part of that if you desire to. Speaking of something you may desire to do also over on social media, you can like us, follow us, tweet us at OPS Podcast Show. A little different than the website, but kind of the same. And I am excited about today's guest. We talked about it last week in our Christmas shoes episode when Garrett stopped by and we kind of teased it. So I grew up, just a little background on me for a moment before we get into the shoes of our guests, which again, I'm excited about. I, in the fourth grade, it was discovered that I had dyslexia. Now, for some of you that don't know what that is, let me help. It is a, it is sort of a, a learning disability that you sometimes see things backwards Words. Sometimes you see them upside down. Sometimes you invert things. It's it's crazy how sometimes when I look at words, I have to really look at it almost like a second glance. Because I'm like, wait, is that is that the right way? Is that the wrong way? So last week we teased that our guest this week would wow you. Now, is she famous? Eh, in some circles. Is she verified on Instagram? No, I don't I don't think so. Has she changed thousands of lives over her lifetime? I think she has, and I am one of those lives. So let me introduce you to her today. It is with great pleasure I welcome in my mom. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Are you nervous still? A little bit. Okay. <laughs> See, this is fun, right? So uh, going back to last week, so I was talking about how we had this wow guest. So just to help with that, with the dyslexic story as well, is when you turn wow upside down, what do you get? You get M-O-M, which spells mom. So I told you already who our guest was going to be, and you probably didn't even catch it, which, you know, sometimes people don't catch things. It is just my weird mind at work, I guess you could say. Welcome my mom in. We've had my dad on. We've had my sisters on. So really, the last person left, if we could find him, would be my brother. Maybe someday. We'll look for that in the future. So we always like to lead off, of course, what style of shoe do you like to wear? Because of what I still do for a living, taking care of kiddos, I like to wear sneakers. And I like the brands I like are New Balance and Skechers. I know. New Balance and Skechers. That also shows your age a little bit because I've seen a lot of old people, my friend Tom included, who was on a couple of weeks ago, wears Skechers from Costco. And then Elizabeth recently was at Costco, which I can't stand Costco. So she goes on behalf of our family. Thank you, honey. I love you that you go to Costco and I don't have to. But she saw Skechers at Costco. And at work now, I have to wear all black shoes. And she's like, I almost got you some Skechers. And Adia was like, no, mom. <laughs> Dad, dad's not going to wear Skechers. They're, they're, they're too cheap, I think is what she said to Elizabeth. They're too cheap. He's, he's not going to wear those. Small Skechers story there. 
as well. But they're comfortable. I've heard that. Rory wears them. Elizabeth's brother, who's been a sponsor of the show as well, wears them. And I, I just won't. I can't. Just a name brand snob, I guess. So back to you. Garrett, speaking of, he was on last week with me. Big fan of the show, obviously. Helped out. Was an executive producer for a long time. Helping me out. Kind of my right-hand guy. You and Garrett have a conversation. I don't know when. Maybe you can elaborate on that for me. Garrett is kind of the catalyst in some respects and the invitor. Not not saying I didn't want to invite you because I would have uh, gladly invited you. I just didn't know you were interested. And so you and Garrett have a conversation. And what do you guys talk about in regards to you being here today? Do you mind sharing that? We had gone to breakfast. He said, have you been listening to this season? I said, Yes, sometimes I don't want, listen every week. You know, I listen two or three times. And, and he said, I think you should go on this season. I think you fit right into it. And I said, uh, I'm not sure about that. He said, because you do not think you are good enough. All of us around you see you are good enough. The problem is you don't think you're good enough for anybody, not even yourself. I think that what you have to say could be helpful to some other people. First off, Garrett being a friend of mine, I'm like, wow, I'm hearing that retold to me. He didn't share any of those, by the way, those details. When you hear that, even as you're re-saying it, what does that make you feel like? People see me differently than I see myself. I know he says, you know, you make a big difference in other people's lives. And I think I don't do anything spectacular. I just do what I know how to do, which is be supportive to parents with kiddos because I've done that my whole life. Now, I know a little bit of your story, obviously, because you're my mom. For those that don't, I know you grew up without a father. Right. And that was a very traumatic event. Maybe walk us back through kind of what you remember and what you've been told about your father and maybe maybe you feeling not enough. I do not remember my father because he was buried the day I turned a month old. My father and mother had been separated for a while because his drinking had become such an issue that my mom just couldn't live with it any longer. And so they were not even living together when I was actually born. She was living with my grandparents, with my three older sisters and my brother. So he took his life by drinking some sort of uh, acid, left a note. He was staying in a, a motel. And all this has been told to me, obviously. I didn't, I wasn't there, so I don't know all that. So he left a number for them to call my mother, which they did when they found him. And then he, you know, called my mom, you know, it was a very traumatic time for everybody in the family. And on top of all of that, they have this baby, babies are needy. And so my grandmother told my mom that you take care of the other four, I will take her. My grandmother really did. I slept in her room at the foot of her bed in in a crib, bassinet, whatever. I only know that because I visited her sister in my early 20s and her sister told me that story, which I was not aware of how that took place. My grandmother did take care of me a lot. I think for my mom, Because of the timing of my birth and my father's suicide, I never felt as bonded to her as I did to my grandmother. And I'm sure that for my mom, I was that reminder of how everybody's life changed tremendously. Do you feel like your siblings blamed you or do you feel like any family members maybe blamed you outside of your immediate family? Yes, I have one sister that told me that the reason why they grew up without a dad was because of my birth and that I was the straw that broke the camel's back. He had a sister that uh, we used to visit from time to time, and she would always say to me numerous times while we were there, I just don't know who you look like. You don't look like the other kids. It always made me feel like, what's wrong with me that I don't look like my siblings? Because 
I didn't think I looked that much different. I think even then what I heard in that was there's something wrong with you. you you're not as good as the other kids because you don't look like them. You don't look like your dad. I grew older. I realized what she was really saying is that I didn't belong to him. That he wasn't really my dad. Like I said, as an adult, I thought, what a rude thing to say to a child. While we would be visiting there and she would say that to me numerous times during the visit, I would get like anxiety, like my heart would be racing. I felt shaky. I just wanted to go home. I just kept saying to my mom, can't can't we go now? Can't we go now? And I remember one time she came to visit our house and had one of the other aunts with her and I answered the door. I said, oh, it's you. And I shut the door in her face. And my mom said, oh, who was it? And I said, oh, well, it was Richardine. And my mom says, oh my gosh, you can't do that. That's rude. And I said, she's rude to me. That part, either in the moment my mom didn't hear or my mom didn't realize that what I was hearing from her was rudeness. So walking back through, not only do you have siblings saying it you have now extended family saying you know basically you don't belong it's your fault now i know you again and you're my mom i know this about you you have a degree in early childhood development in your studies in your degree we're, we're going to lean into that heavily your education here what do you think that does to a child taking you out of that equation and and if you're encountering a child in your center days as, as a director of numerous daycare centers that you've directed and now in, you know in a private nanny sector what do you think that does to a child in your educational background knowing that 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 had occurred well it damages their self-esteem tremendously i realize that now the more i've worked with kids and done my education piece i'm like yeah okay that makes sense why i feel that way head knowledge is one thing heart knowledge is something else and in my head i know that it breaks my heart. I felt like I was not wanted. Everything was my fault. My brother grew up without a dad. In the 50s, that was like the worst thing ever. Not Nowadays, kids grow up in single households and it's people accept it. They just go on. They're supportive. In those days, it was a bigger deal. Take me back in time, if you will maybe two when you're about 10 years old and you know I picture you maybe playing on the playground maybe there's hopscotch I don't I don't know maybe there's a swing set I don't know maybe there's wall ball I don't I, I don't know what you guys did in those days I'm stretching I'm grabbing from my imagination I don't know we we did do hopscotch imagine if somehow you know we could go back in time with you in a time machine and you could go up to you know the 10 year old Marilyn and you could like maybe pull her aside from from the Jacks game that maybe she just won because maybe she's high on life because she just won. You you can pull her aside and you can talk to her. You can have a moment with her. What do you say to that ten year old you? It's not your fault, and God sent you here for a reason. You may not know what that is. He's going to use this situation of not feeling loved or wanted to help other children. And I think through the education piece that I've had and also just years of caring for kids and trying to be supportive of single moms that hopefully I have I've done that hopefully God has used me in that way would your 10 12 year old self believe you I'm not sure she would because I think she was so hurt felt unwanted And I remember when my first nieces were born, my mom all of a sudden was so excited about these babies. And we all were. I can remember thinking, how come she doesn't love me like she loves them? How come she isn't excited about what I have to tell her? She she wasn't. And I think for her, I was that reminder of when her life took a drastic change and how it affected everybody else in the family. So kind of to recap, so you grow up again with siblings telling you, extended family telling you, maybe your own mother, maybe not verbally, but in her actions, definitely checking out emotionally for you, if I'm not putting words in your mouth by any means. Mm -mm. 
True. How does that continue throughout the rest of your life of, of feeling your unworthiness and feeling not enough? How does that continue to play out maybe in segments of your life? Well, I think a big part of it too is when your dad had asked for the divorce, his reasons were that I wasn't very intelligent. I didn't take pride in my appearance. You know, I wasn't attractive. I felt like then I really was worthless. If I couldn't even be enough for him, I'd never be enough for anybody because I thought we'd be married forever. I had not a clue that it would ever come to that. Do you feel like on some level that you've believed a lie for so long that now that lie has almost become your truth by feeling not enough? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. How do you feel like that's really played out in your life, like believing that lie and, and maybe trying to trying to eliminate that lie, but it's so hard to eliminate because it's been there for so long? Well, I think in a lot of different ways, I feel like as you and your brother and your sisters have grown up and made choices in their lives, when I feel like that the choice they made wasn't the best choice for them, from my perspective, that I failed them. If I had helped them more, if I had given them better advice, if I had come alongside them more, they would have made a different decision so that I failed them. So I didn't just fail in a marriage. I failed my own children. And so I think that is something I continually struggle with. Do you ever see a day where you're not going to maybe struggle with that? I think some days I do better than other days. I think a big part of it is just feeling like I want to be accepted for who I am. And I think partly I feel like I I don't accept myself. So I think that's where the struggle is. How do you accept yourself? How do you feel like you need to accept yourself? For years, I've worked on trying to see me for who other people see me for. You know, when people say, oh, you know, at at church, people have said to me, you know, you're the baby whisperer. You know, if a baby's crying or upset, we can give them to you and you can calm them down. And I, I think to myself, anybody can do this. Anybody can do it. And then people say, no, no, not, not in the same way you do. And so there's a part of me that feels, you know, good about that then I think, well, don't be too prideful because that's not a good thing either. Yeah, I think that's the balance. When we know we have an ability that maybe others don't have, there is that like juxtaposition, right? Like, well, I want to be excited about it and and to use your words, you know, kind of proud of it. But at the same time, I don't want that pride to come and take over my life. And then then I have a pride issue because then you're like, oh, now what? But I, I just want you to know for years, and, and when I say years, it's it's literally probably been about 20 years because I remember like kind of vividly the moment when I was like, my mom's really good with kids. Like it was like this epiphany, like I know, silly, right? <laughs> but this epiphany kind of like goes off in my head. And, you know, being in the community that, that we've, you know, we retired in, so to speak, when, when dad got out of the Marine Corps, you know, we, we haven't moved away from where he retired from and, and where we grew up around. And so this community we live in is very small in some respects. And, you know, through the years, I've run into parents who have come through the centers that you've been a part of. And I've run into, you know, parents who know you still by name. And they've all said, oh my gosh, your mom's so amazing. I remember the very first time somebody said that to me and I was like, she just watches kids. Like, it's not that big of a deal. Like, it's, it's okay. Like, she's like a babysitter. Like, big deal. But their eyes and their and their voices and their tears sometimes when they would give me an update to share with you, you know, about so-and-so. And I'm like, okay, thanks. I'll tell her that, you know, Johnny's now in college and, he, you know, he's doing whatever you know, astrophysicist or whatever he's doing, but it always blew my mind. I'm like, she's just a daycare person, but you really have made so many impact on, on these young lives that are now adults. And I think that was when the epiphanies started to come through is like, wow, my mom really is making a difference. I mean, who knew that person taking care of your kid at six months old really does make a difference. You know, parents really appreciate that. And I guess to say all that is how much validation would you need proof that you really have made a difference? 
for it to make a difference for you? Well, I think, first of all, uh, to backtrack of you not thinking it was like a real job. Is this where you tell on me about? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. When your dad was on recruiting duty in the Portland area and I worked at a center and you came back to the center after kindergarten, had lunch, and then at that time I was getting off. And so one day we were leaving and I said, hold on just a minute, Michael's on the phone, I need to wait till she gets off so I can, you know, pick up my paycheck. You looked at me, put your hands on your hips and said, really, they pay you for coming here and playing with these kids? What kind of a job is that? I often think of that. What kind of a job is that? I guess for me, it's never really been about it being a job, but it's being my passion to maybe help kids feel better about themselves, to be accepted no matter what they're going through at the moment, whether they're having a temper tantrum on the floor and you're trying to coax them out of it, or they're going on to kindergarten, first grade, wherever, wherever life is going to take them. Now, I know with your mom being, you know, emotionally checked out most of your life, if not all of your life, you know, obviously grown up, no dad, you have no influence there. And I know your grandmother played it, obviously a, a key role finding out that you you know slept at the end of your bed she took care of you you probably didn't know any of that it was just really cool that she had done that I think back though again thinking back over the span of your life what would you have wanted your mom to do for you in the younger years and maybe even then in the adolescent years and, and maybe even throughout your life what what's that one thing you really wish she would have done for you I think I wish she would have said to me you were wanted you were loved you were you were not an accident your dad loved you too just that his drinking took such a toll on his life and everybody else's that he didn't know what else to do he couldn't continue on the way he was going do you think at any moment that would have changed how you felt about yourself having that validation if you will from her i think it would have i can remember growing up that my brother was born on valentine's day so his birthday was always a big event because it was valentine's day you know heart-shaped candies and and i can always remember my mom doing something special for his birthday my birthday i can remember maybe three or four times that we even had cake when it was my birthday. And one year, I remember my birthday was a Sunday. We had stopped at this bakery on the way home, picked up a cake. It wasn't a birthday cake, but it was just a cake cake. So my oldest sister and her family came over. We had lunch together. We were going to have cake afterwards. One of her kids bumped the table. The cake flipped over, landed on the the top side down on the floor. My mom wasn't even upset about that. She was like, okay, well, that does that and scooped it up and threw it in the trash. And at that moment, I felt like I was the same thing as the cake. I was just trash. Wow. I wonder if, you know, you growing up feeling in your words just now as trash, if that puts you on the path to get into child care and get into, you know, obviously working with people's kids because so many kids have probably been right in those shoes with you, not feeling good enough, not feeling enough, feeling like trash, feeling like the forgotten kid. How do you think that played a role in your parenting? I did not want my own kids to feel like they weren't good enough. With you and your learning disability, I did everything I could through the school system to get help for you. I can remember reading, spending hours reading work to you because that was the way you could learn it. If you heard it, you could learn it. I can remember doing that. And I remember your dad saying to me at some point, how many more years are you going to do this? And I said, as long as it takes. Fortunately, by the time you got into upper elementary and junior high, there was more programs available to help you at school so that you didn't need me to do that much reading for you at home. Yeah, no, I, I remember those times and, and I'm obviously grateful for that. It is true. Even to this day, I hear something and I can generally remember it better than I can if I'm reading it off a of page. That was really awesome of you. Hardest part about raising kids for you as a mom, we'll kind of transition for a moment if you're, if you're okay with that. Because again, you felt at times probably not validated as a mom, right? Right. 
So, so hardest part is uh, for you as a mom raising kids, because not only did you raise Corey and I, that's my brother, but you inherited in, in some respects, I, I laugh as I say that because it's not really an inheritance thing, but you, you know, you end up getting my cousins, your nieces that I affectionately call my sisters, which in all sense of the word, they are my sisters. When I was around, I think fifth grade. So I was around, uh, I don't know, nine or 10, I think mm-hmm. somewhere in that time frame, And they've been on previous. How do you feel like as a, as a mom? Do you feel like you failed? Do you feel like you succeeded? Talk about that. Well, first of all, I had taken care of Brandy and Angel when you were two. Brandy was six, uh, Angel was five, Corey was four, and you were two. Your dad was gone overseas for 15 months. And so I I went from a two-child household to a four-child household overnight. You know, it was a lot of work. In later years, when they came to live with us, I felt like there wasn't enough of me to go around. You and Corey have been raised with rules and in somewhat of a protected environment living on the base. Everybody watches out for everybody else's kids. Nobody gets upset if you correct their kids. It was, you know, it's a community. It's everybody is there together. And that was not something that Brandy and Angel had with them when they came to live with us. They had been really parenting themselves for years. They were left alone a lot, just no guidelines, no nothing. Then I felt like they needed different things than what you boys needed. And it really didn't help with as far as my family was concerned, because they felt like, you know, they had lost their dad. They didn't have any parents, not thinking that we had become parents. So they, my family would buy things for them and not buy things for you boys. And that caused a lot of resentment between you boys and them. And so I felt like it was a juggling act and I never felt like I was really meeting everybody's needs. You know, so often it's it's easy to focus on the that what could have been, what should have been, why didn't I have? I mean, it's so many it's easy to do that. I feel like that's so easy in, in most situations, especially when we look back, like, well, if I would have only known, if I could have done, you know, whatever. But I'm curious about this too. What do you feel like you did really well? Not only for Corey and I, but maybe for the girls as well as as a parent. What do you feel like you you could really celebrate? Like, ah, I'm excited about that. I, I made that moment maybe, you know, happen. Well, I think what I tried to do is say to each of you that you're individuals. You all have your own talents and abilities. And just because Corey's very musical, you know, you can talk to a stranger. You could convince Eskimos in the middle of the worst blizzard ever ever, that they needed more ice, whatever. The girls in their own ways have have found their own things. And I tried to say, just because yours aren't the same, it's still yours. It's still your strong suit. You still need to see that as a plus, as a positive thing. So going back to you again for a moment, what do you feel like those positive traits are in you? Do you see them? Do you feel them? How do you interpret your gifts and your abilities? The family I nanny for are physicians and the dad in particular has so many talents and abilities. Just smart, smart, smart guy. Not that just I think that, but nurses I know that work with him just say he's above so many others. One day I said to him, you know, I look at what you do every day, all the skills you have, and I think you are like a rocket scientist. And he he looked at me and he said, you know, I see what you do with our kids and know you've done them with other kids and know what I do is just everyday stuff. What you do for kids is really rocket science. And I think at that point, I really thought, gosh, yeah, maybe what I do has more impact than I've ever given it credit. So I've been leading off every show all up until this one with this question, are you enough? So mom, I'll ask you, are you enough? Well, I've been told I am enough for lots of people. Right. But you specifically, do you believe you are enough? That's tough. I want to be enough. I hope that someday when I'm not here, that 
my kids, my grandkids will say that I was enough. I was enough for them. I loved them. I supported them. I encouraged them. So I hope I am. But do you believe you are? I think some days I believe it more than others. So stepping back in the time machine, a couple of years ago, I was really struggling to find a birthday present for you that wasn't just a trinket, wasn't just item of object or something to collect dust. And I had this epiphany come to me. I don't know when it was. I decided to get voices together. I had just, I think I was like midstream in the podcast. So I had all the stuff and I reached out to not only family members, a number of your friends and our mutual friends, family friends, all to have them share a birthday greeting. And then they were going to share a trait or a quality that they loved and respected about you, or maybe even a memory. I, I tried to make it as you know big and broad as I could. So it could kind of fit a facet of things. And I, and I called it, I think, Voices of Hope. I don't know how many voices were on there. I want to say 20, maybe more. I, I don't know. I didn't count them and I didn't go back and count. So I put research on that. So I'm going to have to fire the research department clearly. I remember some of the voices hearing it back, not only when I recorded it, but when I put it together, not one single voice on there had anything negative to say about you. So that's what I'm wondering. Like if I filled a stadium with kids that have walked through the centers through the years, or who you've nannied for, or any child that has somehow been impacted by Marilyn Matthews and the impact of her life. And somehow they could come back and say in this stadium situation that they're, that they are proud of you. They're proud of who you are. They, again, their life was changed by being cared for by you. Now I know in Michigan, going back to Corey, cause he always was a big Michigan fan growing up and really put me on the trajectory to like North Carolina. So I really credit my brother for that. Michigan has a stadium in Ann Arbor. It's called the Big House. To my knowledge, it is one of the biggest stadiums in college football as far as capacity. They can seat 102,000 people, by the way, sell out. If we could somehow pack that stadium out with kids and they're all saying they, they, they appreciate you, they value you, they, that you are enough. If I had 102,000 people saying that, would you believe them? I would. I, I think sometimes in the moment of caring for kids, helping families, I don't always see the value of it. In, in recent years, I have seen more, for instance, I got the opportunity right around Thanksgiving to see a, a gal that is a mama and, and she was here in town visiting her parents for Thanksgiving and it was important to her for me to come and see her baby. The first thing she said is, do you want to hold him? Well, yeah, of course I want to hold him. She was just sharing with me what a difference I had made in her life as a child. She has lots of memories of me that I truly don't remember every one of them because you know, I mean, I remember her, of course. Don't remember all the instances that she was giving, all the things. But I think at that moment, I said to myself, stop selling yourself short. You have done what you know how to do. You have been here to help kids, help parents to love them when at moments they weren't the easiest to love. I was able to love them at the moment. Do you believe I, as your son, believe that you're enough for me as, as my mom? That's a tricky one. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I sometimes feel like that you feel like you weren't loved enough, that you were never, never seen. Things you were good at were not seen and appreciated. As much as I tried to do that for all four of you, you know, I... I don't know. I think sometimes you feel like you wish you would have had a different mother. Well, I have looked on the internet. <laughs> I'm, t I'm totally kidding. Sorry. Some levity there. I know it's not possible. My wife tells me all the time, she's your mom. Stop it. You look just like her. I'm like, okay, fine. But I think everything that you're describing as far as your childhood goes, you know, obviously your dad dying, you had no, you had no responsibility in that. None. Zero. He made that choice. And I know you know that subconsciously maybe, but sometimes the heart and the head play mind games with each other or heart games with each other. You know, your mom checking out. I mean that, hello, who, what parent probably wouldn't check out. Did that cause an emotional rift between you and her? Absolutely. Here's the realization that I came to a couple of years ago. 
concerning you and even my father. My dad did not grow up in a very good home. His dad was very, very abusive. Story after story. I think I met his own father. I think I met him maybe a dozen times, maybe less, knowing that 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 was an emotional wreck. Now, his mother, on the other hand, was there. She's solid. She, in my mind, is, is probably got VIP parking in heaven. She's that good. She's a saint. I would recommend her for your mom. I, I have no emotional attachment to whatsoever. It's because she didn't want to have anything to do with us. So, And clearly, she really didn't want to have a lot to do with you either. I say all that because the realization I came to concerning both of you is I had two people that came into a marriage kind of broken, emotionally broken. Did they maybe struggle? And again, this is before I even was in the picture. Did they struggle to love each other through his his career, his duty, his his calling into the Marine Corps? Yeah, I think they did. Now, when they have kids, was there an emotional connection that, that they try their very best to give the emotional support that they could? Absolutely. Did they fall short? I'm sure they did. You're human. Do I blame you and him for any and I'll make it about me in this moment, maybe meeting the emotional needs that I came to expect. I did for a long time, but that's wasted energy. You can't change it. He can't change it. What do we do? We move on. And I'm saying it publicly here. I'm not going to take this out. I don't blame you in any way for what you could provide or what you couldn't provide. You did the very best you could with what you had. Would I have loved to have been better? Absolutely, of course I would have. Can you go back and change that? No. So why blame you? Why be mad at you? Why waste all that energy when I have you now? And I do value you and I do appreciate you. For the record, I wanted you to come on to give you an opportunity to share your story. It's not because you're not valued or you're not appreciated. I just didn't know you wanted to do it. And I didn't want to be, as you mentioned, I can sell things pretty well. Always. Anyone who knows me personally probably knows that as a fact. But I didn't want to sell you on it. I wanted to be your idea. Now, Garrett, of course, being the catalyst of that, maybe making you realize that, I'm okay with that. Garrett's a good guy. But I wanted it to be your idea. I didn't want it to be my idea. How would you respond? And then we'll play a game together. I had thought about it when I knew what this season was. Again, thinking, oh gosh, I'm sure he could find somebody who has a more interesting story. Garrett was like this is perfect. This is the time you need to be on and you need to tell your story so that maybe people will understand you in a different way. Even maybe your kids will understand you in a different way. Because when you're growing up, you don't tell your kids all the heartaches you've had as a child. You don't You don't want to burden them with that or them to feel like, oh, gosh, and she's my mother. All right. You keep those things inside of you to protect them. So I'll give you a moment. Normally, I put people in a stadium, you know, 50-yard line, you know, whatever. We're not going to do that. But I will give you an opportunity right now. It's no secret in our family that, uh, that Corey has chosen to, in some respects, disconnect himself from our family dynamic. For whatever reason, I don't know why. There's a series of reasons I can speculate, but it would only be a speculation. But let's say somehow, some way, this gets into his hands, into his earbuds. Somehow, some way, somebody says, "Hey, you should go listen to this." I'm gonna give you an opportunity. Maybe we should start with at the top. Brandy's the oldest. So, what would you say to Brandy? What would you say to Angel? What would you say to Corey? And then if you choose to, you don't have to. You can say anything you want to me. What would you say to each of us in regards to your story, you being here today, and maybe if they've ever struggled with you, with them wondering, gosh, does you know, does mom think I'm not enough? What would you say to them in that moment? Be a mom for a moment and maybe share that moment with them. With Brandy, I would say I'm proud of you for all that you've done with your four kids and for the life that you've chosen, for being a leader in the church, for touching lives in ways that you may never even know. And I love you. I didn't give birth to you, but I helped to raise you. And yeah, there were some struggles along the way. It doesn't take away from the fact that you are loved. Angel was always the, bless her little heart, um, forgetful. I remember she made a casserole one time and left out a main ingredient. We were like, what? But easily distracted. She has now stayed focused and raising a daughter on her own. And that's, that is a tough, tough job. 
I want to applaud her for keeping that going and for raising a child that she can be proud of and that I love her and I I want the best for her. You know, for Corey, I, you know, it it breaks my heart that he has chosen to really isolate himself. It's hard because, and especially this time of year, because of his birthday, it was him that made me a mom. You know, I think back of those early years of his life when he first got interested in music and I thought, oh yeah, we're going to buy this instrument and it'll, you know, end up in the closet. He had incredible musical talent and it's a shame that he didn't pursue that. I think it could have taken him in different places than it did. You know, I love him. I care about him. I just wish that he would want to be a part of things. And as far as you are, Neil, I mean, of all the kids, I have to say that your early years in particular were were tough, <laughs> tough years. <laughs> is that why your hair is a little grayer than it used to be? Just asking for a friend. Yeah, yeah, it is a little bit. And I, I, I look back now and I, I, I have to laugh because... For instance, the little guy that I nanny for, he he asked me one day, were you a stricter mom or a stricter grandma? And I I think back to having to really make boundaries for you that were unnegotiable because if there was any way to change that, boy, you gave it your own all to change it, to talk me out of it, to, well, what if? And so, yeah, I think I was a stricter mom because I had to be. And because of your dad's career, there was lots of times that he was gone. And even when he was home, he was so tired from being gone part that he wasn't always emotionally available to help. It was a tough job. It doesn't mean that I haven't loved you. I haven't tried to encourage you. I've tried to do all those things. And I hope that all of you will realize that you are you are loved, that you were cared about, that I did all I knew how to do. Yeah. Are you glad you did this? Yeah. Well, let's play a game together. We love this game. It's called Senseless. And so it's a very sad story. My North Carolina cup that I have used kind of from the beginning of the show broke recently. It was on a shelf and the shelf fell and it literally split the cup in half. As you can see, there's glue here. And so I'm very sad, but it is still back together. But I think this is also a symbol of our family, that sometimes we've been broken apart, but there is still glue that can put us back together again, and we can still have fun together, and we are enough to do that. So I think that's a good little little reminder for me. So I'm going to let you roll this. So just roll it, shake it around. There you go. And then tell me what you get. Six. Ooh, number six. I love that question. It's my favorite. Number six is this. So you get to have a meal, one meal. It can be breakfast. It can be lunch. It can be brunch. It can be a snack. I, I don't know. I know you're a big snack time, you know, you know, preschool days, eating goldfish on the steps and can Jill with our hands out and maybe me being in trouble for selling Play-Doh on the playground, homemade Play-Doh because it was saltier than the store-bought kind. A meal with one person, dead or alive, who is it with? My grandmother. Okay. And where are you guys going to eat? Well, I think we'd eat at her house because she was the best cook ever. It didn't matter if it was chicken and dumplings or if it was oatmeal with brown sugar and cinnamon, cinnamon toast and hot chocolate. I would want to spend that time with her. I would want to say to her how much of a difference she made in my life if it hadn't been for her loving me and taking care of me for years while my mom worked, teaching me to to crochet. I can remember sitting on the arm of her chair, crocheting long chains. They had apartments. I can remember her giving me a paintbrush and giving me a portion of the wall to paint. And I'm sure that was strictly to keep her eyes on me and know where I was because, you know, she was in charge of me. Not that my painting would not be painted over. She made me feel like what I was doing was important. Number one thing you'd probably say to her. That I love her, 
that I treasure all those memories with her. Sitting in her backyard while she was pulling weeds in the garden and her singing hymns, singing things I don't sing at church anymore. Those things I hear in my head when I'm missing her. I still, to this day, when I hear A Holy Night, I can remember hearing her singing that. All right, last question is this. What would you say to the lost kids that are out there that maybe... Especially we just came off of Christmas and, you know, we got a new year on the horizon, 2022. It's hard to believe we're even saying that, but 2022 is going to be here in a blink of an eye. But there's some lost kids out there. I, I know some. You probably know some too. But what would you say to those lost kids out there and how would you encourage them maybe to reach out to their moms to maybe get reconnected? I think I would say... It doesn't have to be your biological mom. It can be a mom who has shown care for you, that you can reach out to them and say, hey, I need you in my life. I I need a mom. I need someone to be a sounding board. I need someone who can give me motherly advice. And just let that person be there for you, even if it's not your biological mom. Sound advice. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for doing this. I'm super excited. I sent a couple messages out to some friends and I said, I am a little nervous. Like I get nervous when I have to interview family because I have to see them on the daily. But no, I really appreciate it. And I love you so much. And, and you are important to me and you do, in fact, matter. And you are enough. You need to know that from me publicly. I can't take it back now. <laughs> thank you. No backsies. So guys and gals, kids and campers alike. Wow. What the heck did we just walk through? Well, I'm going to challenge you in this. As I mentioned kind of in our closing, 2022 is on the horizon. Now, for some of you, you may have this lingering shadow of I'm not enough. But I'm going to challenge you in this respect. That shadow does not get to play a role in your life any longer. First of the year is a great time. I don't necessarily do resolutions. I don't think that's a thing. I mean, people do them. It is the thing. But I don't personally do them. I think they're silly. You can do them if you want. And you're kind of silly for doing them, if I may say. But I do want to challenge you this week. Find that mom in your life. Find that motherly figure. Maybe just go give them a hug and just say, as you embrace them, get next to that ear and just say, listen, in a whisper, you are enough. And let me know how that goes. Let me know if you take that challenge seriously. I would love to hear about that. Of course, OPSpodcast.com is a great place to let me know. You, of course, can let me know on social media. Of course, you can DM us. Reach out to us, OPS Podcast Show on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And with that said, we close out Season 9, Season 10 next week. The Shadows cannot wait for that. We have a great lineup for you in January. Until then, let me remind you of this. Do not ever forget. It is so important not to forget. Remember... When you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening. Merry Christmas and a happy new year to you. We'll see you in 2022.